o'clock and good evening ladies and gentlemen y'all that are here uh, keep going through the line get your food uh, like say you're paying for it so you might as well enjoy it and welcome to your 44th annual first bank and trust company stockholders meeting uh, of course it's gotten better every year and we're all grateful for that in another life i remember back i was telling the guys here a minute ago i used to manage a lot of sales and uh, lots of times i'd delay a sale when there weren't too many people there fellow was working for me said well you might better start before you lose what you got so we've got a good crowd tonight we've got people uh, all over the country in several states and even one guy in texas uh, tuning in tonight and we appreciate everybody's being here and being a part of us so uh, uh, i'd like to start maybe a little different than we've been doing tonight uh, some of you most everybody knows our directors and uh, some people out of the area may not so i'm going to start by introducing our directors and uh, of course their bio is on the website and you can uh, check them there uh, first of all bill Hyder, of course you directors you would uh, when they pan in there well, I kind of face the, the camera up there so they can see you in texas or wherever they might be bill Hyder, of course is our first uh, chief executive officer of the uh, first bank and trust company did a great great job he's a graduate of course of virginia tech he started out as a credit analyst for a farm credit system and uh, of course he organized the first bank and trust system and uh, and has done a great job for us uh, he's uh, of course been the chairman of the agribusiness council he's been chairman of the uh, virginia bankers association and uh, he's developing now some economic development things for the hospital here in town and uh, you know it used to be that he was the youngest ceo in the state of virginia but uh, he's been good enough to get over that he's got a little older so he's not the youngest anymore so uh, Bill also runs a commercial cow-calf operation here, and I've been after him to uh, write a book about his experiences with First Bank and Trust Company, and uh, I'm going to buy him about 10 uh, pads and see if he can get that done for us sometime. Also, uh, we've got uh, Ron Barrett, the senior member of the board. Ron, if you'd face the camera there so they can pan in on you, please. And, of course, Ron is also a, a graduate of Virginia Tech and Animal Science. He started his uh, career in Kansas City as a meat grader and uh, then he came back and did the Barrett Farm Supply over in Russ County in Lebanon and I've said many times about Ron if you went in there to buy a pound of beans you got treated the same as if you went in to buy ten thousand dollar worth of fertilizer so uh, he's been on the the uh, bank board here of course since its beginning and um, he served uh, intermittently as chairman and secretary and a local a lot of local boards over in his hometown so then uh, our next fellow on the list is uh, Mark Nelson. Mark is the chief executive officer. You better tell you, face the camera up there, so you're going to be hearing a lot from you, maybe more than we want to after a while. No, he's got a good message. But anyway, of course, he's our president and chief executive officer of the bank now. He's been in banking for 35 years, and he's been with First Bank and Trust Company for 25 years. He's a, a certified public accountant, and he's a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. He's a graduate of Emory Indian College, and um, he's been to the National uh, Bank School. He has a lot of board affiliations here, like People Incorporated, Washington County Service Authority, Virginia Highlands Airport Authority, and Washington County Industrial Development Authority, and of course the uh, Virginia Bankers Association affiliation. And he lives up in Meta View. So when uh, Mark, of course, uh, doing us a great job and the other end is we got David Leonard the second here today if you'd face the camera up there so that everybody out west can see you uh, Dave's a graduate of uh, Radford University and a degree in finance he uh, worked for the Leonard companies and, and well he worked first of all for first bank and trust company as a loan officer and teller etc he's had a grand experience then he worked for uh, Western uh, District North Carolina United Bankruptcy Court and then they currently involved in uh, commercial property leasing and uh, he does a lot of stock market trading something i know nothing about but he seemed to be pretty good at it and had been in he started out also in speculative home building and uh, ownership and management of convenience store so uh, dave is uh, elected to first bank and trust company and uh, about six years ago and then the bank corps uh, this past year in 2021 He's chairman of the uh, bank's uh, compliance committee, a member of the audit committee, a member of the loan committee, and he served, uh, formerly was the president of Russ County Chamber of Commerce and 
worked up people incorporated also. So um, his distinction is, <laughs> if you had him here, has a three-year-old daughter, and he has a, um, a one-year-old uh, daughter who last year was the youngest stockholder of the bank. I don't know if anybody has beat her record on that yet, but um, uh, Dave's had a lot of good records there. So anyway, um, I have to kind of look around here to find everybody. Sophie Chafin Vance. Sophie uh, is, uh, <clears throat> of course, the senior vice president and chief uh, branch operations officer for the bank. Uh, she'd been with the bank now for about 16, 17 years. A lot of grand experience and doing us a great job. She oversees the branch uh, operation performance for 28 locations of First Bank and Trust Company. She's a third generation board member. <clears throat> a lot of you remember her granddaddy, Mr. Cotton Chapin, who was one of the organizers of the bank, served on the board, and then we lost her father, Senator Ben Chapin, a little too soon. Uh, I accepted an honor for Ben Chapin at Virginia Cattlemen's Association this past week. They honored him as a top hand and rightfully so. Uh, Sophie's been involved in a lot of things, South, Southwest Virginia Higher Education Board of Trustees, the Virginia Aviation Board, Russ County Hospital Foundation, and she and her sister run the cow-calf operation uh, that their dad had over in Russell County. Then you've got Ronald Barrett II. Ron Barrett II, you face the camera there, wherever you are. He's raised on a family beef farm over at Lebanon, <clears throat> and he graduated from Ferrum College then he needed a little more education, so he went to um, uh, Virginia Tech and got a degree in animal science then. Uh, Ronnie started out as the manager of a 900 sound farrowing um, operation up here at Foster Falls. <clears throat> he went on to manage a lot of southern state stores up in northern Virginia for about 20 years, and he's currently the assistant director of procurement for surplus operations at Virginia Tech. He's a second generation board member and uh, serves on the bank's compliance committee, the loan committee, and they reside in Christiansburg, Virginia. Then we got Raleigh Hyder. Uh, Raleigh over here, of course, is a, a senior vice president and chief uh, credit officer here at First Bank and Trust Company. He participated in the bank's uh, management associate program and uh, has a degree from Virginia Tech uh, Pamplin School of Business. He serves the Virginia Banker Association Lending Executives Committee He's on the board of the Virginia FFA Foundation, and he serves on the bank's uh, loan and special assets committee. And um, he is also on the security and risk uh, and, and fair lending and ESOP committee here at the bank because we have uh, most every member or employee at the bank, of course, is a stockholder in First Bank and Trust Company. Uh, Raleigh has a new daughter, and they reside over in Bristol, Virginia. And see, then we've got uh, Mr. Trent Yates. Trent, where did you get to? And um, Trent's retired from the former manager of the sales and service at Old Dominion Freight Company up at Withville. He uh, worked for Conway uh, Southern Express Company and Norfolk Southern Corporation. He um, was appointed the first bank and trust company about five years ago and then last year to the um, the bank court board um, he's a second generation board member of course his father mr cbh served first bank and trust company for a long time and just retired from the board this past year uh, he has a bunch of accolades of one i don't know whether i ought to mention or not he is a graduate of the university of tennessee and we don't blame him for that but he is and uh, he serves on the audit committee and the compliance committee, and he's uh, the loan committee. He resides in Bland, Virginia. Then this other fellow, I guess, a member of the board is me, and uh, I started out with the neighbor's team of mules over in Russell County a few years ago and had the good fortune to uh, go to Virginia Tech. And uh, then I went to Virginia Beef Cattle Association, Virginia Herford Association, Virginia Angus Association, and after doing that several years, Form my own sale management company, uh, manage sales from Maine to Florida and west to South Dakota. I have one distinction, however. I have managed the only cattle sale ever held on the Grand Ole Opry stage in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'll tell you, with 50 head of cattle down there on that stage, it's the mi most miserable three days of my life. So uh, anyway, we've all done a lot of things, and that was one of mine. I'd like to make a, well, let's see, we have a man here. Is Keith Phillips here? Keith, where are you? 
Is Keith here yet? Anyway, I'd like to recognize Keith whether he's here. He's back here waving his head way back there. Last November, the Virginia, the National Agricultural Bankers Association had their meeting in Omaha, Nebraska. And we're very proud of Keith. Uh, about 20 some of us went out there to see this happen. We need the education also. But Keith won the Burning Award of the National Agricultural Bankers Association. There are about 800 people there from probably every state in the union and every bank you can think of. But he won that award for all the banks in the United States and there are people there from Canada and a few foreign nations also. And Keith heads up the number one agricultural banking operation in Virginia. We're rated number one in agriculture bank. We do more agricultural loans than any bank in the state and also in the nation. Number four in the United States, the whole nation, we're number four in agricultural uh, loans. Now, you're going to get to hear a little report, these other reports here in a few minutes, but the one thing that we're awful proud of, too, you know, a few years ago, there were 120-some banks in Virginia. Today, there are 63 banks in Virginia, and we're number one in agricultural loans, and we're number one bank also of those 63 banks. A friend of mine up in Culpeper, Virginia, said to me, he's a stockholder, Every time he gets a dividend check, he calls me up. He says, how do y'all do that down there anyway? He says, these banks up here in Northern Virginia are not getting it done like you are. I said, well, Joe, it's kind of simple. We got 452 of the best bank employees in the nation, and that's fact. And that's why things are working so well. These people work, work weekends, they work nights, they go to church. And I think they're even banking, except when the minister's giving his message on Sunday, they're banking all the rest of the time, and they're in clubs and whatever, and they travel and do things and, and are active for the bank. Now, as you know, 10 years ago, we reached the $1 billion mark in total assets with the bank. Well, that was 10 years ago, and we were all real proud of it, starting from a million to a billion and all that. But just two weeks ago, we went to the Shenandoah Valley, and the Shenandoah Valley region reached a billion dollars. So it's just something else to, to behold. And then um, at the Cattlemen's Expo I attended this past week, we had nine or 10 agricultural loan officers there. And they're always talking about banks are slowing down this and that. And all the ag lenders that I talked to they said they have lots of things in the pipeline. Then in December, Mark and I were down to uh, Lillington, North Carolina. We had two fellows from Smithfield Foods that traveled two and a half hours each way just to come over there to talk to us. And what they wanted to talk about was they wanted to do some business with us and some pretty good sized loans. And the thing that they really wanted to be assured was that we were going to stay independent, that we were not going to merge or be sold out or whatever. So we assured them that was the case, that all our employees and our board and all was dedicated to um, staying independent. And talking about Smithfield Foods and the opportunities down there, that Smithfield operation, they kill 32,000, 32,000 hogs every day. So you can imagine all the pigs and everything it takes to supply that, and we're going to be a part of that. Now, we're dedicated, as I said, to staying independent. It's good for our customers. It's good for the employees. And certainly it's good for the stockholders that have been proven for the last 43 years. Now, to do that, you need a succession plan. Most of these banks that we talk about from 120 down to 63 banks have gone that route, have merged or sold out because they didn't have a succession plan. The board decided, well, maybe we don't have somebody to carry this bank on, so the best thing we can do is merge it or sell it. But in our situation, we've got all these good employees, we've got the succession plan going, and for every position in the bank, whether it be in the board, or senior vice presidents, or the key positions in the bank, we've got a plan to hold on to those people. And some of our best employees have come from merged banks. And those people that come from merged, merged bank after they've been here a while, they said, well, the worst mistake I ever made was not coming here sooner. So we appreciate their attitude in that and appreciate their service. And to add to that, we have 32 young bankers in training. We try to pick the best people we can from colleges or wherever we can find them or from other organizations and put them in our training program 
but in doing that, there's a future for them. These young people come to this bank, if they work hard, keep their nose clean, there's a future here at First Bank and Trust Company, and they know that. Now then, you talk about your stock. What's it worth? <clears throat> well, it's been trading, as these guys are going to tell you here in a few minutes. It's been trading for $110 and going up probably a little bit every day. So the bank traded, sold stock in the beginning for $20 a share. We split seven times two for one. And you know, the first six or seven years, maybe the bank didn't get off the ground exactly, but since that time we've been sailing on. So I think probably at 110 or $15 a share, this is just my opinion, no commitment, it's probably a better buy today at that than it was at $20 a share back at that time. Because we are positioned, in good position, in the locations we are, we've got the reputation, we've got the best bankers in the country, and we've got the momentum going on our side. And we have the best staff in the industry. But though when you get up in the air and you get flying around the airplane, you go to these places, you look down, you see all these farms, and you see all the houses down there, you know, at 3.1 billion, we just scratched the surface. There's a whole lot more down there, and we're gonna find it, and we're gonna do that for the stockholders and everybody involved, and the employees, so they'll have a future. So, if you figure stock's worth 110 today, you're gonna get probably $2.18 dividend this year. Well, you're gonna get an easy 10, 12% return on your investment. And they're gonna to talk to you in a few minutes and tell you all these figures. We're returning about 17% on equity this year. At the same time, we're competitive in what we pay for the money and what we sell the money for. Now, have you ever known anybody that lost money buying First Bank and Trust stock? Think about that. You ever known anybody that did? Well, you watch the New York Stock Exchange and you watch the TV and they talk about the market's down today, the market's up today. But our market, except for about three years, we held steady when some of the banks dropped from $50 to $4 and that kind of thing, we held steady. But mostly, if you watch that graph, we're on a steady incline up, and that's the way it's been. You know, one of the keys to that too, I think, <clears throat> in keeping these good customers in North Carolina and places we visited, these people appreciate that the loan officers come out to see them come to their business, come to their farm, whatever, and when they call them, they'll return the call and they get to talk to them. And to prove that, we've got 52 vehicles, 52 vehicles owned by the bank that our people get out and they're active in the community. And then you've got loan analysts, when they get that information back, these loan analysts, they're kind of like tellers of the young sung heroes, and they put that information and take it back. And kind of one of my things is, from my industrial development days, and now too is, if you ain't the lead dog, the scenery never changes. Now you think about these dogs up there in the Northwest that pull these sleds. If you ain't the lead dog, you're looking at something else. So if you ain't the lead dog, the scenery never changes. I guess uh, it's probably time we get on to a little business and uh, uh, may not be as participating here. So then uh, we need to have a chairman uh, for our stockholders meeting. And the floor is now open for a chairman to conduct the meeting. You nominated me, I couldn't hardly hear you. Do you have a second of that motion? Thank you, Raleigh. All in favor? Well, I got a few votes, thank you. Anybody opposed? I must have got elected. <laughs> then uh, we need a secretary to serve the uh, for the meeting also. We have a nomination for the secretary of the meeting. Sophie Chapin's been, uh, Vance has been nominated. We have a second of that. Thank you, Mr. Barrett, got a second. All in favor of Sophie Chapin, Vance being the secretary of the meeting, say aye. She got more votes than I did. Sophie, you done good. So you're the new secretary and with that in mind, you know, um, we need to have a notice of meeting, give proof of notice of the meeting, and Sophie's gonna read that to you, conforming to the bylaws of the corporation, which requires no less than 10 days prior to, no more than 60 days of the meeting, uh, that you be notified of your stockholders meeting. So Sophie. Thank you, Chairman Leonard. 
the notice of the 2023 annual meeting dated March 14, 2023. Notice is hereby given that the 2023 annual meeting of shareholders of First Bank Court Inc. will be held at the Southwest Virginia Higher Education Center located at One Partnership Circle, Abingdon, Virginia, 24210, and via live stream at 6 p.m. on Monday, April 17, 2023. Please visit www.firstbank.com to view the live stream. The purpose of the meeting is to consider and act upon the proposals to, number one, to elect three Class C directors to serve until the annual meeting of the shareholders in 2026, and number two, to transact such other business as may properly come before the meeting. Only those shareholders of record as of the close of business, March 13, 2023, shall be entitled to vote on matters presented at the meeting or any adjournments thereof. To assure that your shares are represented at the annual meeting, even if you plan to attend, please complete, sign, and date the enclosed proxy and return it promptly to in an unclosed, self-addressed, prepaid postage envelope. Your proxy is revocable at any time prior to this exercise. The annual report to the shareholders will be available online March 2022, 2023 at www.firstbank.com by orders of Bank Board of Directors of First Bank Corps. Signed, W. Mark Nelson, President and Chief Executive Officer. Do I have a motion to approve the notice of meeting? Okay, do I have a second to that? Oh, thank you for a second to that. Do you have heard the motion and a second to approve the notice of meeting? So um, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Okay. Now, Sophie, while we're up here and you read so well, would you read to us the minutes of last year's meeting, please? I surely will. The annual stockholders meeting of First Bank Court Inc., April 18th of 2022. The annual meeting of the shareholders of Bank First Bank Court Inc. was held at the Southwest Virginia Higher Education Center in Abingdon, Virginia at 6 p.m. on Monday, April 18th, 2022. This annual meeting was called and conducted in accordance by, with the bylaws of First Bank Court Inc. of Lebanon, Virginia. William H. Hyder welcomed the shareholders that were in attendance, including those shareholders viewing the live stream meeting and provided his opening remarks to the shareholders. He then proceeded to call for nominations for the election of the chairperson for the meeting. A motion was made by Mark Nelson and seconded by Ronald Barrett that David Leonard be elected as chairman for the meeting. Mr. Leonard was duly elected chairman of the meeting by acclamation. The chairman then called for nominations for secretary. A motion was made by Mark Nelson that Ronald Barrett serve as secretary for the meeting. The motion was seconded by Raleigh Hyder and there being no further nominations, Mr. Barrett was duly elected secretary of the meeting by acclamation. The chairman then requested that the secretary present proof of the official notice of the meeting, whereupon Secretary Barrett responded by reading the notice sent to all shareholders. A motion was then made by Ronald Barrett II that the shareholders approve the notice complying with the First Bank Inc.'s bylaws. The motion was duly seconded by Doug Phillips and unanimously carried by all present. The chairman then requested that the secretary read the minutes of last year's st stockholders meeting. Secretary Barrett responded by reading the minutes, whereupon a motion was made by Mark Nelson, seconded by Doug Phillips, that the minutes be approved as read. The motion was unanimously carried. The chairman then requested that a canvassing committee composed of Eric Moore, Monica Anderson, and Samantha Mitchell be established to determine the number of shares represented at the meeting by proxy or in person. The chairman provided his comments to the shareholders and then called on SVP and Chief Credit Officer Raleigh Hyder to provide an update of the overall company's credits and his goals for 2022. At the conclusion of the credit report, Raleigh Hyder called upon Chief Financial Officer A. Eric Moore to provide the prior year's financial update, whereupon a full and complete financial statement was presented and detailed comparison was made of the bank's performance for the years of 2017 through 2021. Following Mr. Moore's comments, President and Chief Executive Officer W. Mark Nelson presented to the shareholders an overview of the company's activities from the previous year and his vision for the future. The chairman then requested that the canvassing committee report its numbers to determine if a quorum was present, whereupon the shares were tallied by Mr. Moore reporting that there were 5,848,715 shares represented at the meeting out of 8,297,263 total shares outstanding. Of those, 3,721,969 shares were represented by proxy mail and 2,126,746 shares were represented in person giving a total representation 
of 70.49% shares outstanding. Chairman Leonard then declared that a quorum was present and the meeting duly in session. Chairman Leonard then explained that in accordance with Title IV of the Articles of Incorporation, stockholders shall vote to elect directors for a three-year staggered term. The rest directors are designated as Class A, B, and C directors. It was noticed, noticed, noted that three Class B directors' terms had expired in 2022, and therefore requests for nominations to fill the vacancy were sought, whereupon a motion was made by Mark Nelson that Class B directors Ronald Barrett, William Hyder, and David Leonard II be re-elected to serve an additional three-year term until 2025. The motion was duly seconded by Raleigh Hyder and Ronald Barrett, William Hyder, and David Leonard II were duly re-elected to the First Bank Court, Inc. Board of Directors. Chairman Leonard then noted that two Class C directors' terms had expired in 2022 and therefore requested for nominations to fill the vacancies that were sought. Whereupon a motion was made by Mark Nelson that Class C directors Ronald Barrett II and Raleigh Hyder be re-elected to serve an additional one-year term until 2023. The motion was duly seconded by Trent Yates and Ronald Barrett II and Raleigh Hyder were duly re-elected to the First Bank Court Inc. Board of Directors. Chairman Leonard called for a motion to fix the number of directors to serve for First Bank Court Inc. Upon motion made by Ronald Barrett and seconded by w William Hyder and duly carried, the number of directors was fixed to nine. Chairman Leonard then asked if there were any additional business to be brought before the meeting. Mark Nelson responded by making a motion that the acts of the directors and officers be approved for the past year. The motion was duly seconded by Raleigh Hyder and unanimously carried. Chairman Leonard made his closing remarks and then asked for all directors elected to meet immediately following the adjournment of the meeting at the corporate center for the reorganizational meeting. There being no further business to be brought before the meeting, a motion was made by Trent Yates, seconded by Ronald Barrett II, and duly carried to adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Good reading. Good. Thank her third grade teacher, she said. I'm sure that's right. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes of last year's meeting? Thank you. Do I have a second to that motion? And I have a second. Any discussion on the minutes? All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. Okay. I would like now to uh, appoint a canvassing committee. Uh, Eric Moore, our CFO, and uh, Monica Anderson and Elizabeth Dean, if you all would be so kind as to go count all the proxies and everything that came in to see if we can be duly in session. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've come to the part of the meeting you really came here to hear about um, what this bank is doing financially, what its future is, and the way things have been going. And I think you have an outstanding report coming up, so we're going to ask uh, Raleigh Hyder, our chief credit officer, to come up and give that report, and he'll introduce uh, the CFO and the CEO that will give their reports, and you're in for a real treat if you haven't studied these numbers. They're really great. And I don't know a bank anywhere in the country you'd find any better. Raleigh? This support enables all of our lending staff from the front end to the back office and everywhere in between to translate our lending expertise into actual revenue by allowing individuals and businesses the opportunity to grow and provide for their families. I believe Jamie Dimon said it best in his 2022 report to annual, annual report to shareholders when he said we are champions of banking's essential role in the community. Its potential for bringing people together for enabling companies and individuals to attain their goals, and for being a source of strength in difficult times. 2022 brought a number of challenges, and as bankers, we were relied upon every day for financial advice, either from our church, a nonprofit we were involved in, or a neighbor down the street. What more confidence do you need when you're backed by a bank that sits on a strong foundation, whose board and senior management are involved, and who em whose employees genuinely care about your success. Tonight you will hear your bank's results due to the culmination of these facts. 
for Mark and Eric, but first, I want to make you aware of how First Bank and Trust Company's loan investments are performing. We had another outstanding year in terms of loan growth, growing total loans year over year from $2.1 billion to $2.4 billion, a 15% increase. Our loans have almost grown by $1 billion since 2018. Loan growth in 2022 was primarily driven by relationships established in new markets, existing clients wanting to begin a new project they had otherwise put off due to inflationary costs, and the bank's financial position. This financial position allowed us to be involved in larger projects due to our capital and allowed us to secure new deals by leveraging our strong liquidity position when other banks didn't have the cash to turn it into profitable investments. These investments produce earnings, which in turn produces more liquidity, so long as the quality is sound. This continues to be the case, and I'll summarize our credit quality in just a moment. As I mentioned, we ended the year with $2.4 billion in loans, having a strategic goal to grow net loans by $225 million. I'm happy to say we more than surpassed that goal by growing net loans $389 million when accounting for $59 million in PPP forgiveness. PPP has now concluded, and even with the runoff, we experienced the largest loan growth in our history. The pillars of our loan business continue to be commercial, residential mortgages, and of course, agriculture. As we look at some of our most successful markets, at least two of these pillars are present, and oftentimes these segments build off one another. This creates stability in our loan portfolio and stay amongst our clients. Moving on, this shows our loans closed in 2022. It continues to amaze me the volume of loans that turns at this company. In fact, we have more than three times the number of loans compared to other banks our size. Last year, we closed almost 1.2 billion in new loans, over 5,400 loans. Most of this continues to be on the commercial side of 680 million, followed by agriculture of 300 million. The current rate environment drove more individuals toward in-house mortgages versus the secondary market, which in turn provides us more of a yield on our portfolio. More importantly, I want to point out our net interest margin and how consistent it has been. We have been able to maintain our margin of around 3.85% during a rate decline from 2018 to 2020, and then again during the quickest rate increase seen in the last 40 years that occurred in the last 12 months. Now, performing at a high level not only means loan growth, it also means being disciplined about your quality and I believe we continued that strategy in 2022. Our non-performing assets remain historically very low and well below peer as our equity position continues to grow. We ended the year with non-performing assets as a percentage of total loan at just 15 basis points, which is half of that of our peers, and non-performing assets as a percentage of tier one equity plus reserves at 1.11%. That also very low, 50% lower than our peers at 2.72. In addition, we are always mindful of our past dues. Our past due percentage at the end of the year was excellent at just 43 basis points of total loans. This is a result of hard work by our credit department, our underwriting philosophy, and our lenders knowing our customers. Next, I wanted to touch on our loan loss reserve. This reserve is in place to account for the possibility of future credit losses, which luckily we've had very little of the past few years. In fact, we had more recoveries in 2022 than we had charge-offs. We began the year with 28.9 million in reserve, and through a number of loan loss provisions, we added another 7.8 million to the reserve. This addition was not due to deterioration in credit quality, but rather to account for our record loan growth. We ended the year with $36.7 million in reserves, or 1.51% of total loans, up from 142 from the previous year. Now, as far as accomplishments are concerned, I, I believe the numbers speak for themselves. We met all of our loan goals in 22, and all of us here at the bank have a lot to be proud of. We exceeded our loan volume expectations and met our desired credit metrics. We were able to maintain our margin 
in a truly challenging rate environment by working through new and existing relationships so clients can see the added value of our superior customer service. If problems arose, we dealt with them swiftly and fairly, and we continued on our mission to seek out new products, industries, and geographies to further diversify our investment. This annual meeting is always about the results of the previous year. However, what really matters is how we take what we've accomplished in 2022 and build on those achievements so that the results in 20 2023 and beyond support our long-term strategy of growth. We intend to grow net loans by 272 million in 23, and we are well on our way with loans already up 110 million at the end of the first quarter. We will not sacrifice quality for growth and we will strive to maintain a profitable net interest margin by not sacrificing long-term gain for short-term benefit. Lastly, we must be open to utilizing new technologies that make our loan process more customer-centric and create efficiencies for our lenders so that more time can be spent out of the office and speaking with customers. In closing, First Bank and Trust Company has a lot to be proud of. We see our client's perspective we understand the long-term strategy to remain independent. And we have a confidence to take the resources provided to us to be a source of strength for our community. Now that concludes my comments, but now please join me in welcoming Eric Moore, our Chief Financial Officer, who will give us an overview of our bank's financial metrics. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Eric Moore, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer for First Bank and Trust Company. And it's my privilege to be here this evening to report to our shareholders the outstanding financial results produced in 2022 by the employees of First Bank and Trust, many of whom are in this room tonight. Total assets increased $296 million year over year pushing the bank past the $3 billion threshold, ending at $3,142,000,000 at December 31st, 2022. This represents annual growth of 10.4%, and the bank has grown over 73% in the last five years. With this growth, First Bank and Trust Company now stands as the ninth largest bank by asset size headquartered in Virginia. For the third straight year, the bank experienced robust deposit growth, with total deposits increasing from $2,484,000,000 at the end of 2021 to 2 billion million at December 31, 2022. The total increase for the year was $287 million, or 11.6%. Non-interest-bearing demand de uh, deposit accounts have grown over 112% in the previous five years and currently comprise about 27% of our total deposits. The amount of equity capital increased $23 million during 2022, and this is after paying out dividends of $16.6 .6 million to our shareholders. With this strong capital position, First Bank and Trust significantly exceeds all regulatory defined thresholds to be considered a well-capitalized institution. Interest income totaled $125,368,000 for 22, an increase of almost $22 million from 2021. While some of the increase in interest income can be attributed to a rising interest rate environment, the primary driver was the $389 million in new loan growth, which was detailed by Raleigh in his presentation. Interest expense for the year was eight, just over 18 million at 18 million and 77,000, a significant increase over the previous year. With seven Fed funds increases in the latter part of 2022, and two more already this year, interest expense will be dramatically higher in 2023. However, effective management of our interest rate, net interest rate margin will still result in increased net interest income in the coming year. Net interest income for 2022 totaled 107.3 million, 
up $12.7 million over 2021. If you look back over the last five years, you'll see that interest expense can vary considerably. Peaking in 2019 on a much lower deposit base at that time before bottoming out in 2021. Yet net interest income has shown consistent growth across the years. This is a result of disciplined, proactive approach by management to always focus on the net interest margin, regardless of where the interest rate environment is or is where it's headed. If you recall Raleigh's slide on the margin comparison, the margin has remained remarkably consistent over time at about 3.85%. We added a, almost $8 million in 2022 to the provision for loan losses, and the reserve stood at $36.7 million at the end of 2022, creating a strong position going forward at a time when there are a lot of uncertainties in the economy. Other income totaled $22,334,000, driven by strong performance from our mortgage division in the first half of 2022. Other expense increased $2.6 million in 2022, equating to about 4.5%, which is pretty good performance when you consider that the consumer price index for all of 2022 was about 6.5%. A significant portion of our increased expenses was related to the hiring of new production personnel. Our largest expense by far is salaries and benefits for our employees, which accounts for more than 60% of our total non-interest expense. The bank's efficiency ratio, a key metric of operating efficiency, was approximately 47% for 2022, which is about 10 to 15 basis point or percentage points better than most of our peer banks, who typically will be in the low to mid 60% range. And after paying income taxes of $12.6 million, our net income totaled $47,919,000, a 13.7% increase over the $42,135,000 earned in 2021. Net income per share for 2022 was $5.78, an increase of 70 cents per share over the $5.08 earned in 2021, and represents an increase of 13.8% in earnings per share. Over the past five years, earnings per share has increased almost 82%. Cash dividends paid to shareholders increased 9% in 2022, going from $1.84 to $2 per share, an increase of 16 cents per share. And our book value per share at the end of 2022 was $34.32, increasing 9% over the previous year. Average equity to average assets declined 37 basis points in 2022 as the institution continued to experience rapid asset growth. Return on average assets remained steady at an outstanding 1.62%. And just so you know, average banks across the United States run somewhere between 1% and 1.2%. So 1.62% is outstanding. Our return on equity increased from 16.95% in 2021 to 17.62% in 2022 and cash dividends declared as a percentage of income <coughs> totaled 34.6%. With the recent failures of two large institutions, Silicon Valley Bank in California and Signature Bank in New York, we've gotten a lot of questions from shareholders and customers about why those banks failed and why First Bank and Trust Company is different. Those are very valid questions and I just want to touch on some of the fundamental differences between our bank and the characteristics of those banks which led to their failure. More than anything, the composition and characteristics of their deposit bases were the determining factor in their fate. Uninsured deposits are those deposits which exceed the $250,000 FDIC insurance limit. All banks have uninsured deposits to a degree. But as you can see from the chart, Silicon Valley Bank had uninsured deposits of over 97%, and Signature was just under 90%. 
the average level of uninsured deposits for United States banks is around 40%. At First Bank and Trust, we have 26% of our deposits which are uninsured. When it became known that Silicon Valley and, Sign and later Signature were experiencing some difficulty, those uninsured deposits began exiting those institutions, causing a crisis with their liquidity levels when they didn't have enough cash to pay out the depositors. Rather than very large commercial clients with huge deposit balances, the customer base at First Bank and Trust is very diverse, from individuals to small businesses to small farms to churches to nonprofits, all sorts of small customers. Types of customers which typically do not exceed the FDIC insured limits. And for those customers who may exceed the $250,000 FDIC limit, First Bank and Trust has long been a leading provider in utilizing the IntraFi deposit placement services, which provides the option of full FDIC insurance and peace of mind to those customers who would like to be fully insured. In the previous slide, I mentioned that when customers started leaving Silicon Valley and Signature, they didn't have enough cash on hand to pay out those depositors. This is because banks like Silicon Valley have more of a focus on investing customer funds rather than a lending model like First Bank and Trust. When customers demanded payouts of their accounts, Silicon Valley had to sell a sizable portion of their investment portfolio, which due to the rapid increase in interest rates was worth a whole lot less than when they had bought it. This in turn created significant realized losses which severely impacted their capital levels. First Bank and Trust has always considered itself to be a lending bank, which is to say we want to make loans in our communities, not buy bonds from all over the country. As you can see from the chart, Silicon Valley's investment portfolio represented more than half of their assets at 56.1%. The average portfolio for U.S. banks is somewhere around 25%. And you can see that the First Bank and Trust investment portfolio at the end of the year was 3.3% of our assets. Generally, investments are only acquired by First Bank and Trust to provide collateral for public deposits, which is required by state law. While there are some unrealized losses in the small First Bank portfolio, they are not material to the bank's overall balance sheet, and it is not expected that any losses will ever be realized from that portfolio. All of our investment will be returned as those securities mature. And finally, I want to touch on our capital levels. The core capital ratio for First Bank and Trust is 9.91%, almost a full percentage point above the average for U.S. banks of 8.98%. Our Tier 1 risk-based capital ratio is 13.43%. The Federal Reserve defines a Tier 1 risk-based risk ratio of 6% to be adequately capitalized. And First Bank and Trust is more than double that standard. A ratio of 8% is considered to be well capitalized. And again, we significantly exceed that standard. For total risk-based capital ratio, 8% is considered to be adequately capitalized, and 10% is considered to be well capitalized. At 14.68%, First Bank and Trust Company, again, far exceeds those regulatory standards. Looking forward, as we move into 2023, actions taken by the Federal Reserve to control inflation including raising interest rates and reducing the overall money supply, along with the end of many of the COVID-era stimulus and assistance programs, will make deposit growth more difficult in 2023. With fewer deposits to go around, the competitive landscape for those deposits will be heightened as banks fight for those funds. We will proactively manage our funding and our liquidity sources to ensure that we can continue to profitably grow our loans while maintaining a very strong liquidity position. As I mentioned earlier when I was discussing interest expense, our funding costs for the bank will be substantially higher in 2023 than in 2022, which makes it all that more important 
to maintain our consistent net interest margin. We will be challenged to control our net interest expenses in 2023, considering the cost of just about everything has gone up and continues to go up. This will require discipline and adherence to the conservative principles of the bank, which has been a core for this institution since 1979. The number one selling point for our customers has always been the excep exceptional customer service that they receive from all of our employees. But to retain and attract deposits, we must also continue to improve and refine our systems, offering industry-leading technology and products to our depositors, both on the retail as well on the commercial applications. Now, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our President and Chief Executive Officer, Mark Nelson. Thank you. As Eric said, my name is Mark Nelson, and I have the privilege, the honor, and the responsibility of being the CEO and President of the First Bank and Trust Company and First Bank Corp, Inc. And tonight I want to highlight our employees some, but first I want to say thank you to Chairman Leonard, to Eric, and to Raleigh for your excellent remarks and review of our bank's 2022 results. I also want to thank each shareholder present, viewing remotely, and the ones that could not be present tonight for the investment, the confidence, and business placed in the hands of our board of directors management, and employees. I am really proud to present again this year the 448 employee names that serve our clients daily and congratulate each of them for a job well done. It should be noted that 98% of our employees are also shareholders as participants in the bank's retirement plan or individually owners of our stock. The record results that were presented by Raleigh and Eric could not have been presented without all of the dedication and hard work that each of these individuals do on a daily basis for our company. They have a vested interest in the bank's success. The names are listed by the years of service. Also this year, I want to take a moment and I'd like to introduce to you our bank's executive staff. And I want to ask each person as I introduce them to stand and face the camera if they are present tonight. Monica Anderson, 17 years with First Bank and Trust Company and 30 years in the banking industry. Scott Arnett, Senior Vice President, Wealth Management Manager, eight years with First Bank and Trust Company, 10 years in the banking industry. John Bowers, our Senior Vice President, Regional Manager in the Shenandoah Valley, 22 years with First Bank and Trust Company, 35 years in the banking industry. Brent Dyson, Senior Vice President, Regional Manager in Southwest Virginia, seven, seven years with First Bank and Trust Company, and 19 years in the industry. Looks a lot younger than that. Jim Edmondson. Vice President, Internal Auditor, six years with First Bank and Trust Company, 37 years in the banking industry. Hugh Ferguson, Senior Vice President, Regional Manager, East Tennessee, 11 years with First Bank and Trust Company, 38 years in the banking industry. And he only wishes he'd have come a little earlier. Brianna Green, young lady that really helps me a lot, Corporate Shareholder Communications Officer, She's had seven hard years at First Bank and Trust Company working with me, but I really appreciate all she's done for me. Raleigh Heider, uh, Senior Vice President, Chief Credit Officer, nine years with First Bank and Trust Company, all of it here with our company. Kelly Ken Kendrick, Senior Vice President, Regional Manager, newly this year the Regional Manager for our Blue Ridge region. 16 years of experience, and all 16 years with First Bank and Trust Company. Matt Linder, what a hire he was. Chief Information Officer, six years with First Bank and Trust Company, 23 years in the industry, and we wish we would have had him for the whole 23 years. 
Jim McAllister, Senior Vice President, Commercial Lender, managed our Blue Ridge region up until this year, picked his successor, and has worked closely with her and continues to work for our company, Originating Loans. 19 years with First Bank and Trust Company, 45 years in the industry. Eric Moore, the Chief Financial Officer, he's been with me way too long. 19 years he has been with First Bank and Trust Company, but he has been with me for 27 years. It's his whole career in the industry and has done a great job for both companies we worked with. Keith Phillips, Senior Vice President Agriculture Lender, 22 years with First Bank and Trust Company, 37 years in the industry, and he deserved the Bruning Award. He is dedicated to agriculture, and if you ride with him a little bit, you'll find out how dedicated he is and also how dedicated he is to ensuring the success of the agriculture division moving forward, bringing along his assistant manager, Bradley Webb. Andy Puckett, Senior Vice President, Mortgage Division Manager, four years with First Bank and Trust Company, 18 years in the industry. Sophie Chafin Vance, Senior Vice President, Chief Branch Operations Officer, and I said it a little earlier today, I've had her do a lot of things over the last few years, but she's been with us for 16 years and it's all been with First Bank and Trust Company. And Caitlin Widener, who couldn't be with us tonight, but she's done a great job. And I hope this year you saw the digital annual report. Her and her staff did a magnificent job with the annual report. Seven years, all at First Bank and Trust Company. All of these individuals get all the credit for all the things that have been done. And I'm so proud to be a small part of each one of them and the accomplishments that they have had over the years and continue today. But I will tell you, they're leaders who empower, they're leaders who encourage, and they're leaders who acknowledge. They also care about their employees, they're driven, and they all lead by example. So I think you would, you would agree with me that the future of our bank is in great hands with this staff. The, the quote that I wanted to bring out, the future will be written by a talented, dedicated workforce that is committed to maintaining a nationally recognized and community-focused institution that embraces change, that benefits clients, communities, and builds shareholder value. I would tell you that I just introduced to you the talented workforce, and we will continue to work to train, to retain, and to recruit new individuals to continue the future of our company. But I would like for you to give a big hand, of round, a big round of applause to each and every one of the individuals that helped make our company what it is today and will help continue it into the future. As you can see on the map, our, our bank continues to expand in Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Our bank operates within five geographical regions, three divisions, with a newly re renovated operations and training center that includes 26 full service offices, eight loan production offices, and in March of 2023, we added an additional loan production office in Clinton, North Carolina. We're really proud of what's going on in North Carolina and the ability for us to continue to build on our niche product, agriculture. We also recently signed a lease for a loan production office in Western Richmond that will help us continue to build our overall loan portfolio on the commercial side in the Richmond area. We're real proud of that. In 2023, in the fall of 2023, we also plan in converting our Mount Airy branch, which is currently a loan production office, to a full service office. And to, to go back to what Dave said, the reason that we are going to convert that office is because the local bank that had been there for many, many years, Surrey Bank, was acquired by one of our competitors recently. And we believe we can go there and we can build our deposit base in that Mount Airy area. 
I'd like to take just a few minutes and talk about the regions and the divisions that we have and just a very few highlights that I wanted to bring out. And I want to start off with the Southwest region, which is managed by Brent Dyson. Total deposits increased by 76.4 million or 8.6% in 2022. Southwest Virginia is by far our largest deposit base with near, nearly a billion dollars in deposits. At the end of the year, there was 969.5 million. We had loan growth last year of 10.6 million and a 3.3% increase. We're gonna continue in Southwest Virginia to be competitive. We're gonna to continue to focus on our agriculture. We're gonna to continue to focus on commercial. We're gonna continue to do something that we've always done. That's the government lending in Southwest Virginia. And we're also gonna make sure that we have home loan products that can meet the needs of the communities. So Southwest Virginia is a big part of our company. It fuels a lot of our opportunities and we're really proud of all of the things that, that have happened and will happen in Southwest Virginia. The Tri-Cities region, total deposits increased by 39.1 million or 7.4% in 2022. We had loan growth of 61.8 million or 20% in 2022. And we're, not going, we're going to continue to look in Tennessee and parts of Alabama and parts of Georgia for opportunities that we can continue to expand our Tennessee region and areas around it to provide opportunity. The Shenandoah Valley region, need, need I say more, 837.2 million in outstanding loans. It's our single largest lending division that we have. It's been a remarkable success story for our company. And we're really proud of what's, what has happened in the Valley and what will continue to happen there. Deposit growth in 2022 was 100.4 million or 17.5%. Loan growth of 109.8 million or 15.1% in 2022. Jo managed by John Bowers, we're gonna continue to leverage our loan and commercial relationships to drive core deposit growth. We're also going to continue to look for strategic expansion areas in the Shenandoah Valley. And we are al already doing that with our new Western Richmond Loan Production Office. The, the Blue Ridge region, deposit growth of 29.8 million or 6.7% in 2022. Loan growth of 49.8 million or 7.4% in 2022. I talked a little bit about the transition of the Mount Airy Loan Production Office to a full service office. We still have opportunities in the Blue Ridge area where we utilize part of North Carolina is in that region, which is the Mount Airy office. But we're gonna continue to look, and I know Kelly is gonna do a great job managing that that region to look for new areas that we can continue to expand, continue to take our products and be successful. But it doesn't go unnoticed that there's 721 million in loans that are outstanding as of the end of 2022. North Carolina, what more can I say? We went down to Eastern North Carolina. We were very fortunate to go and opened an office that I talked about last year, which was Red Oak. It was a small office in a small community, but it gave us the opportunity to, to have an opportunity to meet new lenders and to continue to grow our company. And grow we did. If you look at the outstandings in Eastern North Carolina, as of December 31st, there's 133 million in loans that we've been able to do down there. High quality loans, to high quality clients to be able to meet the agriculture needs of that area. And there's a lot more opportunity there, but we're really proud of, of going there. We had talked about it for many years. We finally found the right group of people to go down and, and work in that area. And I must give credit to a young man who's sitting in the audience tonight, Bradley Webb, 
who has worked with those individuals to help them understand our culture, to help us help them understand our credit quality, and to be the greatest buffer he could. A lot of times, some people give me the credit for, for, for managing the North Carolina group. Well, it really isn't true. That's Bradley Webb. But we're real proud of that group. We're proud of the fact that we have opened up, that we had a the loan production office that's opening up in Clinton, the agriculture hub of that area, which is really going to help us. We've got a really strong lender there, really strong support, and we really believe it's going to continue to fuel our growth in eastern North Carolina. We also converted our Lillington office. We went there with a loan production office. We had no real intention of converting that to a full service office very quickly, but we saw the need to go ahead and open up a full service office and it'll pay for itself. When you get 100 million in loans, it sure will pay the bills for you. So we're really proud of that office. We're proud of the deposit growth. May not look like very much now, 12.9 million, but it certainly is a start to a very successful future in Eastern North Carolina. So we're real proud of, of what we're doing that as we are all of our divisions. Leads me right into the agriculture lending division. And, and we talked about the Bruning Award with Keith Phillips, but the real reward is to all of our clients. Throughout our entire footprint, we have 685.2 million in agriculture loans that other banks may not have made that other entities may not have made. But we had the right lenders, the right approach, and the ability to grow this niche product over the years. We're also, the, as Dave talked about, the fourth largest ag bank in the nation. What a real tribute to be from Southwest Virginia and be the fourth largest ag bank in Virginia. And I give all the credit to Bill and all the, the, the board and everyone that had the ability to see the future of agriculture and to commit to it in 2003, to hire Keith and to bring that into our company because I think it's done a great job as well as our commercial, our mortgage, and many other things. But the ag loans comprise about 28% of our overall 2.5 billion in loans. Our mortgage division, even with the changes that occurred in 2022, we had solid performance. We continue to grow our in-house mortgages that Raleigh talked about, growing by about 44.2 million, while also growing our secondary market loans by about $62 million. So even when adversity has come before this company, we've found ways to continue to build our company, to continue to meet the needs of our communities, and that's what we'll continue to do. We're committed to it. We service all of the loans we sell, which makes us different than a lot of banks that are out there. First, trust and wealth management. We almost gave up on this several years ago, but we didn't, and thank goodness we didn't. Because in 2022, we had about $464 million of investable assets that people put with our trust department that are not on our balance sheet. They're part of a trust and brokerage division. They're managed assets. They're part of brokerage accounts that have annuities. And they're also non-managed assets that people want to buy a certain stock, and we hold it for them. But I'm really proud of the fact that in 2022, we were able to increase our net income by about $132,000, or 18.1%. Or and I give all the credit there to Scott Arnett and his ability to step in when the previous leader left our company and to continue to manage us forward in first trust, trust and wealth management. I'm also really proud to talk about tonight on Friday, all of our individuals that were in our previous operation center across from the Virginia Highlands Airport here in Abingdon relocated to our renovated, newly, newly renovated operations and training center that's located right across the street from our corporate headquarters in our, our 667 West Main Street branch in Abingdon. We're really proud of this facility. It's about 5,000 square feet less than what we had at the operations center across from the airport, but it gives us the opportunity for our individuals to have a great working environment, 
the state-of-the-art environment, for them to be able to have that environment and continue to, to support all of our other areas. Operations is, is a lifeblood to, to all of our individuals out there, and I know that sometimes we forget that. I, we try hard not to, but it's vital to the overall bank operations. And I, I could not say it any more prouder, the fact that today we have about 53 people in that back office. When I came to the bank in 1998, we had about 58 people in that back office. We've continued to transition. We've continued to use technology. We've continued to make sure we had the right people in the right jobs there. But operations is critical to our success going forward. And I really hope that each of you, as owners of that building, will go by there and see what you own because we're really proud of it. And I told them when they, we were coming out of the operations center, because you know, when you've been somewhere for 25 years, like one of our employees had been, and I'd been in, in that office for 22 years, you know, you kind of don't want to go anywhere else. But I told them if they would just trust me and believe in me, that the new office that they would have would be better than what they had today. And I believe they all have, even if they lied to me, they absolutely told me that they believed that. So we're real proud of the Operations and Training Center. Dave talked a little bit. He took my thunder on our stock because... I'm going to do it a little differently here, but, but if you made a $1,000 investment in 1979 in our stock, Dave talked about the seven stock splits, you would, have earned, you would have bought 50 shares of First Bank Corp stock. That would equate today to 6,400 shares. And that $1,000 investment, if you decided to sell your stock today, would be worth $704,000. So we're really proud of, of what we've been able to do, what, we've, what our, the individuals before me have been able to do, and all of the things that have been achieved for our community. I'm just the opportunity. I got this opportunity by all of the hard work that was put forth before me. I was just the recipient of coming in at the right time and a lot of things happening positively in the short time that I've had the privilege to be the president and CEO of this company. But you can see the last three trades in the last month, all three trades have been at $110. I am proud to say to you that if someone wanted to sell the stock, there's a, there's a, a pretty good sized list of people who are willing to buy your stock today if you were willing to sell it. And I have a lot of calls that come to me from shareholders who will just be fishing and they'll say, you know, I'm thinking about selling a little bit of my stock, and I'll say, okay, let me give you a couple of names, and they'll take, they said, no, I don't want to really sell it. I was just trying to see if it was, it was, if I could sell it. So we're real proud of our company. The dividends per share in 2023, we've already paid out a dollar and seven cents per share, which equates to about $8.8 .8 .8 million dollars. But the better story is the fact that we've been able to increase our dividends over the last five years by 74%. We've also at the same time been able to, to increase the stock appreciation by about 121% over the last five years. But enough about the past, let me talk about as of March 31st, and it's actually somewhat the past too, but I do want to bring out a few highlights here that if you look back and compare March of 22 to March of 23, our total assets in March of 22 were 2.8 billion. In, in March of 30, March of 23, our assets are 3 billion 87 million, about a 214 million dollar increase, or seven and a half percent. Total deposits, 2.7 billion dollars. At the end of 2022, March 31st, we were at. 2,508,000,000, an increase of $200.6 million, or 7.9%. Total loans, as Raleigh talked about, total loans, at, and Eric, they fuel all of our opportunities. If you look at our total loans, have grown to $2.5 billion from $2.1 billion at the end of March 2022. A $394 million increase 
while at the same time paying off about $55 million of PPP loans. What a real tribute to all of the lenders of our company and all of the support staff. We couldn't give them enough accolades for all the work that they do for our company. Total shareholders equity increased to $294 million. Eric talked about the percentages. I like to talk about the whole dollars. There's $294 million of equity that's been built $1 at a time through earnings for this company. $294 million. And you can see that the increase is $28.5 million over last year. And we have to make a little money. We're in, the, we're, in the, we're in the banking business, but we are a business. So the net income for, for the first three months of 2023 was $12.4 million compared to last year of $12,089,000, or a $330,000 increase, or 2.7%. No company could achieve anything without strong goals. Raleigh talked about the $389 million in loan growth that we had last year. We set our target for 2023 based on what we saw the economy doing. We said that we would be fortunate if we could grow our loans by $272 million in 2023. Well, I can stand here today and tell you, Raleigh told you, that through March 31st, our loans had grown 110 million. I can tell you through today, our loans have grown 130 million dollars. So we have got a great start to exceed our loan target in 2023. Eric talked about our deposits. It is gonna be a challenge, but with the technology that we invested in, with all of the people that we have who go out and talk to the individuals in our communities, we believe that we can continue to build our deposit base. We believe that we can continue to grow it. We believe in 2023 we're going to grow it by $204 million. Our capital growth, we believe that we'll grow about $35.6 million. Eric talked about the dividends. Our target for 2023, based on the Board of Directors reviewing it, is $2.18, which $1.07 has already been paid. We believe that we can have another strong year in earnings because of the significant loan growth that we've had and the effective management of the net interest margin that Eric and, and Raleigh have worked tirelessly on to ensure the long-term success of our company at 1.61%. The return on average equity of 17.27%. Dave talked about it, it's what fuels our company to be able to stay independent. We've got to continue, we have to continue to manage our company, to grow our, to, to have a return above and beyond what people could get other ways with their investment. With all of that said, I know Eric talked about, about Silicon Valley Bank and about Signature Bank, but I'm here today to tell you, our bank, has none of the characteristics of the two banks that were closed by the FDIC. And Eric brought out those points in his comments. There is no question about it. From, from Bill's tenure as the first CEO of this company, and the only CEO, till I got this great opportunity, we have always been a lending bank. That's what makes us who we are. He put that in our minds. He drove it home to all of us that we were never going to be an investment bank. We were going to be a lending bank, and, he, and that success has, has carried over. We have bought some investments, but as, Ed, as Eric talked about it, those investments were to allow us to generate the public deposits, which are a significant part of our deposit base, to allow us to go back and make loans in those communities, too, with the government lending. But we are a lending bank. I will tell you today, we are a safe, sound and secure bank that remains focused on the deposit and lending needs of our communities. And we ask you as the management of our company, our shareholders, to continue to do business with our bank. Refer your friends, refer your family, refer your neighbors. We will continue to operate our company as a business and our business will be banking. We're not going to get out on the fringes of everything else that banks do. 
We're going to focus on what we can do. We're going to hire the right people to loan money. We're going to hire the right people to go out and develop the deposit business to, to fuel that lending. We're not going to have an insurance company. We're not going out. We've tried some of those things. We've not done very well with them. We're geared toward lending and deposit gathering at a low cost. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to work to meet our 2027 vision to grow assets to $4.5 billion. If you'd have told me that 10 years ago, I'd have told you you probably need to go see a psychiatrist. We probably, were, we probably couldn't do it. But there's lots of times that I've been way too conservative, and I believe this company has the right people to be able to, to exceed that target of $4.5 billion in 2027. I believe that we will do the right thing. We will manage our net interest margin. We'll manage our interest rate gap and we'll continue to be effective in earning a reasonable profit for the work that's performed. And I think we can earn $65.5 million in 2027, at the end of 2027. I'll also tell you that'll equate to $7.89 per share and provide dividends of $3.05 per share. But we can't accomplish any of these goals without a couple things. It's great to have a vision. I have lots of visions. Some of them I can't make come true. But I can tell you that our board is committed to creating a strategic plan. Every year we create a new strategic plan. It's a five-year plan. And that plan is how we're going to be able to get to achieve our vision. Without the strategic plan, the vision would be nothing. We're also, we're, we're really going to stay true to that process, and we're also going to stay true to our core values and our core mission. And I tell you, our core values have helped us over the years. Eric talked about it. Being a little bit conservative and a little bit aggressive at times has really fueled our company and helped us to go forward. I've talked a lot tonight, probably more than most people want to hear, but I usually do that, if anybody that knows me. But I would like to once again thank all of you for the investment that you've made in our company, for all of the opportunities that you've created for the 448 employees that we have, not only for what has been accomplished, but what will be accomplished in the future. I would go out, as Dave said, I truly believe with the $294 million in capital, that the best is yet to come. Bill said that many, many times over the years, that the, if we could just keep building the capital, we would have the fuel to give the opportunity to do great things with a great company. And I think we do have that today. The record results speak for themselves. A, a lot of times we try to make something what we want it to be. But it didn't happen by luck. I use that phrase a lot, but I really don't mean it. It happened by everybody working together. And I know that if we all continue to work together, we're never going to agree on everything. I certainly don't agree a lot. Sometimes I just like to argue with myself, I believe. I agree with it, and then I just disagree with it. But I do appreciate each and every one of you. It's great to see all of you here tonight. You know, it, it has been tough for me. You know, in 2020, we didn't get to have this meeting. We did it virtually. In 21, we didn't have very many people there because we were still had COVID. Last year, we had a few more. And this year, we've got this room full. So I, I'm really proud of all the people that are here in the room. And I'm proud of all the individuals that are viewing this um, live streaming. And I will tell you, the live stream, I hope we will continue to do it for years to come because we have significant shareholders who lived in Buchanan County who now live in Florida and they just called me on Friday telling me that they really appreciated the opportunity to be able to see how the bank was doing and not have to fly up just for a couple hours. So with that Mr. Chairman I've talked way too much but I really appreciate the opportunity and I believe you've got some additional business to take care of. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. You did a great job, but you had a lot of great numbers to work with, and that sure does help any time. You know, uh, 
I think one of the amazing things to me that we've got two and a half billion dollars worth of loans and Raleigh and Eric and them have managed this thing so we only got a point four three in the past due notice. That is outstanding. And uh, Mark had a lot of great material to work with. I've often said, you know, that Mark and all the things he talks about and the way his mind works around, I said, how can you put that much knowledge in a little head like that? But he's got it there, so uh, we appreciate that. And he, I'll tell you another thing about Mark, too. When he makes a decision that affects one segment <coughs> or one person or something, he kind of thinks, well, how's that going to affect the other division or the other person? And that, that's good thinking, and, and I appreciate that. Now, we've had a canvassing committee out working, and Eric, I believe you've got a report from a canvassing committee. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to report that there are 6,356,537 shares represented at this meeting. Of those, 3,886,274 shares are represented by proxy and 2,470,263 shares are represented in person. There is a total of 8,298,700 shares outstanding, which gives us a total percentage of 76.6% of shares voted. Thank you, Eric. I believe that's probably a record. That's the most votes we've ever had, isn't it? And with all that number of shares outstanding, that's outstanding. So with that in mind, uh, Eric, we will declare the quorum present and this meeting is duly in session. So in accordance with Article 4 of the Articles of Incorporation, stockholders will vote to elect directors of First Bank Corp for staggered terms so that we don't all get elected at the same time. Directors under First Bank Corp Incorporated are designated as Class A, Class B, and Class C directors. Now the Class C directors, the term expires this month of 2023, those are Sophie Chafin Vance, Ronald Barrett II, and Raleigh Hyder. So then, uh, do I have nominations to fill these expiring terms? You make a motion then to fill them with the people that are expiring? All right, do we have a second to that motion? Have a second of the motion. All in favor to fill those expiring terms with the people that uh, expired that they come back, let it be known by saying aye. Opposed? Thank you. Now, we need to set the number of directors uh, that will uh, serve for the next year. Uh, do we have a motion for the, uh, the number of directors to serve for the next year? Mr. Hyder's made the motion that we fix the number of directors to serve for the next year at nine directors. Do we have a second to that motion? And I have a second. All in favor of that motion, let it be known by saying aye. Opposed, no. Now then, uh, do I have a motion to approve the actions of the directors and the business uh, conducted in the past year? Thank you. Do we have a second to that motion? Thank you, Ron. Do we have a second to that motion to approve the actions of directors of the past year? All in favor say aye. Whew, I'm glad that got passed. <laughs> well, with, you know, with numbers like that, it'd be hard to, uh, probably not to pass it. So uh, anyway, uh, is there any other business to come before the meeting that you can think of? I'm going to go out on a limb here a little bit, and I'm going to ask, does anybody have a question that they want to ask a CEO or any director or anything about the bank? Do you have a question that you want to ask about the bank? Anybody? Sounds like there are no questions. Everybody must be happy, and I guess with a report like that, it'd be uh, uh, hard not to be happy. I'll say one thing about this bank. It's a caring group of people the 448 or 50 people that work for this bank are caring people, they're a family, they care about each other. If we have people who are sick in the bank or we 
have a death in the bank that we all consider it as family and we, we all work in that direction. We all care about each other. Not only that, we care about the customers that we work with. And I think you go out, whether it's in North Carolina or Tennessee or Virginia, wherever you go, and you talk to customers, they'll say that First Bank and Trust cares about me and they work with me. I'll give you one example. A few years ago, you know, rather than going to the courthouse on Saturday afternoon and selling somebody out, we try to work with somebody if they get in trouble to work out a situation where that they can survive, if at all possible. A couple of years ago, we had a situation where we worked with the individual. There just wasn't any way to make it work, and we had to have an auction. And as the auctioneer stepped up on the gavel to have the sale, as he started to make his remarks about having the sale, the owner stepped up and said, just a minute, Mr. Auctioneer, I have a comment I'd like to make. He said, I'd like to say that First Bank and Trust Company has done everything in the world they could to try to save my business, but they couldn't, and I appreciate them for the effort they've made. So you know, that's the way we operate, and that's what brings us new customers, and we care about each other, we care about people. So I want to thank everybody who's come. I want to thank everybody who may be watching this live streaming or wherever you might be. And uh, if there are no questions, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I have a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? I have a bunch of seconds. There you go. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> well, we will declare this meeting adjourned. Let me tell you, there's plenty of food over here. Some of you didn't get a chance to eat. Now, you have paid for it. You can eat it. It is yours. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you for watching. Good night.